Frankenstein is a story that's taken on a lot of meaning in our culture. It's often interpreted as a cautionary tale about scientific hubris. And to some extent, I think that's certainly true. Dr. Victor Frankenstein creates a living creature that the world has never seen before. He's intoxicated by the belief that he can do so, and he plows ahead without any forethought. But I think it's a mistake to see the novel as anti-science. I'd like to think that Mary Shelley would have applauded um, Dr. Frankenstein's urge to create, to advance knowledge, um, to innovate. But once having created, he had certain obligations to care, to care for and nurture his creation. Instead, he abandons the creature, leaving it without shelter or comfort or care of any kind. Even when the creature explains how desperately lonely he is and begs Dr. Frankenstein to make him a mate, um, the scientist refuses. It's a tale that is certainly about irresponsible science, but also about lack of care and disregard for others. Those are my preliminary thoughts, and we're going to hear from experts from many different, several different disciplines in just a moment and who are going to share their views about the meaning of the novel today. Frankenstein, or rather his creation, Frankenstein is the man, and the creature, the monster, is unnamed in the text, has gotten quite the bad reputation. A closer read, though, finds an artifact of human creation that goes off into the world without significant malice, but hungry to learn things, to be around people, for food, gets in a little bit of trouble for this. He may have been created by Frankenstein, but he has a history and exists within a social context that shapes him as he does it. The Hastings Center's project on gene editing and human flourishing takes seriously these questions of technological shaping. It looks beyond whether gene editing will be safe and effective at producing particular therapeutic or enhancement related outcomes like new treatments for genetic conditions or the ability to select for an offspring's traits. Rather, the project asks what it would mean for these things to be possible in the real and flawed world in which we find ourselves. How might, or will, the ability to genetically shape ourselves affect our ability to flourish? thrive as people, as individuals, as members of communities? What does this kind of newfound control uh, mean for the kinds of choices that we'll be confronted with? Gene editing isn't the first way that we've been able to exert control over the shaping of ourselves and our offspring. There's long been ways to make changes to genetics, to select for and against certain traits using assisted reproductive practices, and to use a number of everyday technologies to make ourselves see better, stay awake longer, move from place to place more quickly. But CRISPR, or gene editing technologies, just make these easier and faster and cheaper. And so we need to have conversations about what we should do in addition to what we can do. Uh, so I used to always teach Frankenstein as an English professor, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't really know much about Mary Shelley. Um, but I didn't like I didn't really love the book because let's face it, there's not a lot of strong women in it, and so I would spend a lot of time kind of in apology mode with my students. And then I, you know, I didn't again. I then I'd move on to the next book, and I'm a highly educated individual, as you can probably tell, even looking at me, and. I never knew that Mary Shelley was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who's the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. It's very interesting to me that, that this book that I felt kind of apologetic about as not having strong women in it was written by the daughter of maybe one of the most famous strong women of the 18th century, Mary Wollstonecraft. So out of that kind of question that I was asking, how did Mary Shelley come to write Frankenstein when her mother was cool, radical Mary Wollstonecraft? I went on a kind of obsessive journey to find out more about Mary Wollstonecraft. I realized after I'd done all of this work, I realized that in fact, in many ways, of course, Frankenstein is a story, the first science fiction novel, whatever, we'll talk about that as we go forward. But it's also a dystopian vision of a world without mothers, which Mary was an expert on, and a world without the influence of strong women. And essentially what Shelley is really saying is, look what happens when we don't take into account women, and during that time period, the values that women stood for, nurturing, parenting, education, etc. So in many ways, I think that the subtitle for Frankenstein should be Frankenstein, not modern Prometheus, but a world without mothers. Uh, so I'm going to come at this conversation from a little different angle from uh, 
obviously a comic book angle, but from a or from a creative writer's angle, um, and <clears throat> explain that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the influence of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein on my book uh, Destroyer, which is not a retelling of Frankenstein; it's a continuation of Frankenstein, right? Because as all of you probably know, at the end of Mary Shelley's novel, uh, the monster sees Victor Frankenstein die on the boat, and then he says, I'm going to go off into the Arctic, and I'm going to set myself on fire and die. And what I decided was that um, he's not going to do that. The thing that I took most out of uh, Mary Shelley's novel uh, was, um, I mean, along with all its brilliance and all this stuff, was that idea at the end of the novel that when the creature goes on his tear and begins to kill uh, all those who Victor Frankenstein loves, he does not do it, I would say, out of a, because he's a monster or anything like that. He does it because he has been spurned, his love has been turned away, and he has been taught that he is not a being considered worthy of love by this man. And I wanted to write a comic about a woman and her child who might also feel that way about this country and how that might be the, how their rage and their desire to destroy might be just as justifiable as the monsters, even if by the end you hope that they won't make that choice. So what you see here, it doesn't look like a, a monster brought to life, but these are the two papers that, that announced the invention of CRISPR-Cas9, which is this newest gene editing tool. Uh, published in 2012 and 2013 by r groups of researchers. You can't, you know, I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but like there's not just one author of any of these things. Um, and it was the, their, these papers signaled the, the coming true of something that people had been trying to do for a long time, which was once we figured out that DNA was this double helix, that we understood the structure of, of DNA, the idea of making changes to it was all, always there, right? Always there is this enticing um, prospect, and that's partly because there are single gene disorders that cause huge amounts of suffering. And so the idea being that it would be great not just to know what gene caused that disease, but to actually be able to change it. And that's what inspired the Hastings Centre to get kind of into this stuff, because we're like, oh, we really like talking about that other stuff that people are sometimes a little uncomfortable talking about. And we used human flourishing as a way to try to talk about things beyond safety and efficacy. And so one of the things that this project has led to is a book that's coming out next year. I really hope that it has a better cover than this thing that I made. Yes. <laughs> this is like what, why, you, you know, this is my monster. This is like my really cheap, I didn't even want to pay for a really nice image I got off the internet of a book coming out next year called Human Flourishing in an Age of Gene Editing in which we invited about 20 people who we identified various ways to write about what else they think is at stake in a time when you can make these kind of changes. You know, we're inspired by CRISPR, but we're also thinking about genetic selection, various other ways in which we um, can sort of shape who we are. So in the book, we are exploring both the kind of in, um, internal motivations that you might, people might have or the resistances that one might have to making changes over who our children are, but also some of the social forces including you know, racism, or, um, sexism, um, ableism, that bear down on prospective parents as they consider how much control to have over future generations.